Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is D Diane Sayre, and Diane ran as an independent candidate for the U.S. Senate um, in, in the November election. Um, so, Diane, you know, I've been a candidate myself, and it's so daunting, and there's so much to learn, and so much when you learn there's so much you really don't like about it. So tell us about your experiences. <laughs> it's funny that you say there's so much you don't like about it. I mean, what I hated about it was the bureaucracy and the fact that the United States is clearly suppressing freedom of speech and debate. And we've come to a point where now people almost get terrified if they have a disagreement which is terrible because it means you're never going to um, come to a higher level or come to an actual policy direction which people can get behind. So those things, the the onerous signature requirements, 45,000 signatures, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a terrible thing. I could do nothing else for six weeks. Uh, we tried to raise a lot of money going into that period because I knew I wouldn't be fundraising. I wouldn't be doing PR. I, all I could do is go to meetings if I could guarantee 100 signatures there. And we you know, had what go on. What I find so, so unfortunate about the uh, number of signatures you had to get, you know, I know Howie Hawkins and I've spoken to Howie Hawkins on a number of occasions. So after the election, I did an interview with him and he was, you know, I mentioned the fact that you got over 60,000 uh, signatures and he didn't qualify for the ballot. And he was angry about that. And he said, you know, he kind of thought that maybe you got it. He said, I should get the names out of a phone book. But, you know, it, in that case, the establishment has won their case because here he is outside looking in and instead of coalescing with you and say what's our common ground he he criticized you for meeting the threshold and he didn't well uh, yes he certainly did and he had some more un unfavorable things to say uh and i heard that a little bit from larry sharp also uh people said oh did you really do it because by their approach, you couldn't do it except through some trick. But, you know, I'm a veteran. I have been a political warrior for 35 years almost mm -hmm. with LaRouche, who was called every name in the book, who was thrown in jail. Uh, and it builds a certain kind of um, strength Plus, mm -hmm. I was drawing on the fact that we had successfully gotten LaRouche on the ballot in the past in New York many years ago, but we still had an institutional memory of all of the nasty tricks involved mm -hmm. in New York. So I had a great benefit in having about 20 people who had been through petitioning campaigns. Mm -hmm. And then we added to that another 150 people that I've just met in the state of New York in the last couple of years who share my passion for the fact that our nation is going horribly awry and that we are facing a danger of nuclear war. And no one wants to talk about that. And there were no candidates other than myself in New York who were making this the major issue of the campaign. And I frankly think if <laughs> it is a major issue, if we're going to still be alive to discuss all the other issues, mm -hmm. this sort of has to take priority. You know, I, I have cable and I watch MSNBC from time to time. And since I do, you know, I talk to you, I talk to Scott, I talk to other people on my YouTube channels. And I've kind of become accustomed to, you know, interviewing and asking questions. And when I turn the TV on and I hear the way they ask questions, it they ask it in such a way that it promotes hate. 
You know, they talk about, oh, you know, what are we going to do about hate? But the media is the number one villain in in, in that situation. Would you Absolutely. agree? Oh, totally. I totally agree. And it's worse. Uh, think about some of the journalists trying to set up President <laughs> Biden to get him to say that we would go to war to defend Taiwan. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Several months back. So they literally try to put words. Would you say that Putin is a killer? Well, yeah, right. I mean, so it's not just hate here, but it has international strategic implications, what the press mm -hmm. does. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, look, John Brennan was the head of the CIA. Now he's at MSNBC. That's not secret. That's in your face. So if we wonder why the intelligence agencies or the the news media seems to serve the interests of the intelligence agencies and the so-called military industrial complex, I guess we can see it right there. Right, right. So I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go on. That's okay. I uh, now I'm trying to remember what I, <laughs> what I was saying. So continue. We'll we'll there'll be more. The um you talked about the number of signatures that you had to get. Right. Uh, and it it was it really skewed things. On the other hand, like so much of what these criminals in the this duopoly, because you can see that the Democratic and Republican Party are completely unified in silencing everyone that they don't like or don't think will toe the line. Um but it backfired also because by my having to do this, I created the largest grassroots organization in the state. Uh, that wasn't sufficient to counter for the control of the mainstream press and the blackout of my name. But in terms of on the ground people organizing, I don't think there was anyone running for office in the state that had a machine similar to what I had and also the dedication. And many people, uh, I got some radio interviews, one in Buffalo and the person said, your volunteers are so determined. I mean, that lady just wouldn't take no for an answer. These uh -huh. are volunteers who are imbued with a mission and it comes across. And I got this over and over again from people I would intersect telling me that they'd never met. They'd never met anyone as determined as my volunteers. And uh, that's really how we we did it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think I think the the message of, you know, avo avoiding a nuclear holocaust is a pretty powerful statement. I mean, who who's against that? You know? <laughs> well, I met a few people in the street who didn't think it was nearly as important as abortion rights or other things. I think partly people are not in reality um, who say that. But but the overwhelming number of people, of course, would say we can't have this. And I think certain events are making it more and more clear to people that this is a very real danger especially now that we do have boots on the ground, so-called advisors in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little more about your campaign. Well, uh, I, I did a couple of things to build this network and inform this network. One is I started a newspaper, The New Federalist, which came out every month and allowed me to... Um, give people an organizing tool. Mm -hmm. So we would cover what was happening internationally, the starvation in Afghanistan, the situation with Ukraine, but also we covered things like the housing crisis, homelessness, what's happening to the farmers, things that are very um, New York issues, the urgent need for building major water infrastructure, uh, things like that. And, and that circulated anywhere from five to 10,000 or 15,000 copies per month. And my volunteers were distributing it. Um, and I was inspired in that actually, believe it or not, by Huey Long. <laughs> oh boy. Did you know that he had, a, he um, created this huge newspaper network in Louisiana. And if he had something 
that he wanted to get out, he could get out a million copies within 24 hours because wow. people would all come to these little intersections and someone would run through the state dropping off bundles of whatever it was. And then everyone could do it. And I said, well, I might get thrown off of the social media. I'm not going to get covered in the mainstream media. So maybe I should <laughs> see if I can create a, um, a network like that. So is it online? Is your newspaper online? You can see it on my website. Uh, okay. You can see a PDF on my website. The other thing I started was a Friday night symposium, uh, again, to have a roundtable of people who didn't necessarily agree on everything, mm -hmm. but to talk about urgent matters like the really terrible mistake of shutting down the Indian Point nuclear plant. Um, I had the head of the Long Island Fishermen's Association on. This was not for endorsement, but people who had things to raise. Uh, she was very concerned about the wind turbines that they're planning to put all over the coast of Long Island, which will destroy the fishing industry and maybe drive the whales away. There's so many frequencies and things from these wind turbines. Um, we had people who run major food programs in the city. This past, and I'm continuing this Friday symposium, I think it's really a, a very valuable uh, resource. This past Friday, I had two gentlemen from Buffalo. Um, one is the minister of a church who started a big, actually, health program pre-pandemic, because both African-American, very concerned about the number of African-American men whose funerals he was presiding over. He's a minister and he said, why are they all dying in their 50s? And it, of course, was diabetes, hypertension. So he developed a network through the churches to improve the baseline health of the population. And when the pandemic hit, um, he got a grant and set up a phone bank. And they actually reached 400,000 people on the phone. Wow. In the county, yeah, and they delivered fruit, vegetables, PPE. They took a survey of people to find out if they were depressed. They actually cut the death rate because he said, you know, I know my community, if there's a pandemic, we're going to die in much higher rates than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So after this program kicked in, the death rate in Buffalo among the African American Hispanic population actually went down even below the death rate of the Caucasian population. It was phenomenal. And that was uh, pre-vaccine. So you, it, it really was um, just this actual care and reaching people and delivering healthy food. Um, and he has commented as well as other people that the baseline health of the American people is really in a decline. This is one of the things that's taxing our hospital system is that people are much sicker when they come in mm -hmm. and then we don't have the staff to care for them. But so these are things that I learned as part of the campaign and engaging people in this discussion process, which is, is what I really had hoped for um, because my fundamental belief is that people are good. And I think the American people are good. I think people want to be good. I don't think people wake up in the morning and say, gee, who, whose nation can I destroy today? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's the mindset, but they're not given the resources or the knowledge to have an idea of how they can act for the good. So mm -hmm. that's part of what I was hoping to, to organize and to give people. So how long was your campaign? When did you decide to run? Um, really, I had wanted to run since 2018. Wow. <laughs> um, but I officially declared in, I think it was around May of 2020. Mm -hmm. So before that presidential election, I declared my intent to run against Schumer. I knew I would have to get a long running time up because obviously he has so much money and he's got the FBI and everything else on his side. Um, so I started early trying to build organization, meet people all over the state, create little chapters, distribution networks of the paper, et cetera. 
Now, when you say he's got the FBI on his side, what are you saying? Well, when uh, newly elected President Trump said that he wanted to reorganize the intelligence agencies, and I mm -hmm. think he may have, he probably was thinking that on his own for some time, but General Michael Flynn, who, you know, had been fired by Obama for saying that we shouldn't be arming ISIS, <laughs> And um, Flynn actually apparently wanted to audit these intelligence agencies, which would be talk about cleaning out the Aegean stables, for goodness sakes. So Schumer had said on Rachel Maddow, this is stupid. They have six ways from Sunday to get back at you. And that just left such a stench in my nose uh, because... If you think of what the FBI and the CIA have been involved in, or the NSA um, prior to 9-11, you know, the targeting, the McCarthyite witch hunts, what they did to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the Kennedys, the targeting of political leaders, the lying about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, of course, we have to do something about this. Of course, they should be cleaned out and reorganized. Why do we have, I forget, I read this book by two CIA whistleblowers that was published, I think, in the 60s. And by the third edition, these intelligence agencies, I think I'm not, I think they had something like 300,000 employees. <laughs> I mean, why mm -hmm. do we have this? It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's more than that now. So when you would go around and talk to people and you would tell them what you're telling me right now, what was their reaction? People were enthusiastic. Of course, many people said, well, why are you running as an independent? You know, no one ever gets anywhere. And well, you know, I feel that uh, the elections are somewhat rigged as it is. You see the blackout. So and I knew that. I wasn't opposed if any party had wanted to endorse me, if the Republican Party wanted to put me on their line or if the Democratic Party wanted to dump uh -huh. Schumer, I would have accepted to be on their line, but I would never have accepted to abide by their, you know, agenda. No mm -hmm. one's going to tell me <clears throat> what to say. Uh, other people very commonly, the response I would get after speaking somewhere is people would say, you know, you just addressed everything on my mind. No one else is talking about this. Mm -hmm. That's what I got very frequently. Wow. So um, when you would say this stuff, what what was the reaction from the political elite? <laughs> Well, they didn't want to hear from me, obviously. That's why I couldn't get into that debate. Right. And they made up totally arbitrary rules, like having to have 15% on opinion, an opinion poll, which doesn't mention my name. Um, I thought it was quite telling. You know, there was a poll, Trafalgar, I think is the name of the polling agency, that included me. And according to that poll, I had 5.1% of the vote which is extremely high for an independent candidate. And there were some funny shenanigans, I'll just say, on, on the counting of the vote. On election night, I had uh, 55,000 votes statewide, according to Associated Press, the New York Times. And if you tallied all the counties by county, uh, that was Tuesday night. By Friday, my vote had somehow diminished to 25,000. Um, and Rockland County, where I live, actually, uh, election night said I had 5.8% of the vote, which would cohere with what this poll said I should have. I had 6,212 votes. But mm -hmm. by Wednesday morning, I had 277 votes. Oh, my God. Yeah. And 0.2%. <laughs> And so I've sent a letter, a freedom of information request to all of the boards of elections to find out exactly how this is, that the more votes they count, the fewer votes I had. So did you ever get to the bottom of this, how exactly this happened? No. Can you imagine? They haven't responded to my requests. <gasps> really? 
Yeah. So if they do that to you, they probably do it to other candidates besides. I, I think so. And and you have to say, well, why? OK, so five percent, I wasn't going to win. So why was it so important to them to even take that away? And I think it's psychological warfare. You know, the message is give up. And and they want to demoralize my supporters. You think you did something, you got her on the... You realize they said I had fewer votes than the number of signatures I got to get on the ballot. Right, it's, right. It's so absurd. Um, but I was I prepared my team for this because we knew we were going against all odds. And, and I can say happily, I don't think people were demoralized at all. We knew we were in a different kind of fight. So because the situation the world situation is so dire right now would you say that the establishment the political elite whatever phrase you want to use do they know that they're kind of like on their way out and that they're grasping for straws you know that's a very good question uh i think the ones at the top definitely know they've lost it because you don't need censorship if you're in control, right? You don't have to silence debate if you are confident about your power. So I think they do know they're on the way out. Uh, they're sitting on a financial bubble, which is going to implode at any moment. And they're just trying to loot every last nickel out of the American people through you know, all kinds of, it's not just taxes, like people think of taxes, but what do you pay to cross a bridge in New York City? Mm -hmm. What do you pay a parking garage or parking meters? What's rent? Um, the people are being really looted to mm -hmm. try and bail this thing out. And, you know, something I know near and dear to you on the question of student debt, Right. Um, people were I thought really foolishly outraged about the idea of debt forgiveness of any amount. And I said, don't worry about it because it's not even going to happen, <laughs> which it didn't. It was taken back. And because why would they do that? It's just a bailout of the banks, right? It's right. just the students are just a through a pass through for the banks to get more hyperinflationary bailout money. So I think the elites are very well aware that they're on thin ice and they want to control the trajectory of the collapse, including even if they plunge us into World War III. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think it's so urgent to talk to people about the solutions. We have a beautiful situation here in New York because we have Franklin Roosevelt Right. But he was classified as a tra traitor to his class, right? <laughs> yeah, and I guess he was. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> but actually, wouldn't you say he saved capitalism because of his programs? Oh, I mean, he saved the world, really, um, because, one, he understood very well the... Um, destructive nature and evil of the British Empire. And he was very clear on that. And, you know, he had an ancestor, Isaac Roosevelt, who actually collaborated with Alexander Hamilton. Oh, wow. Yeah. And FDR wrote a paper about Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, um, when he was in college. So he had a very profound understanding of the American system and the fight against the British Empire. And in the book by his son, Elliot, called As He Saw It, there is a description of a meeting that Elliot was privileged to be in on when FDR said to Winston Churchill that at the end of the, he said, look, the United States is not trying to fight Hitler just to defeat Hitler. We, we think that all 18th century methods should be eradicated. Every nation has a right to have its independence. Mm -hmm. And Churchill totally blew up. He got bright red in the face. He said, that would be the end of the British Empire. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the reasons 
It was the view of Lyndon LaRouche, and I think there may be something to it, that the British deliberately prolonged the war, refusing to do the Normandy landing till very late in the game and diddling around in northern Africa and Italy because they wanted to be sure that FDR was no more by the time the war ended. They didn't want Franklin Roosevelt to be there to oversee the post-war world. So they realized that he was a sick man. Yes, the polio and yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what, you know, I know you've run for for elected office before. So for everybody listening to this, who would be interested in changing the system, what lessons did you uh, take away from your run with Schumer? Well, I think we have to have faith. I think it's very important for anyone working in a fight like this to not look to external indicators of whether you're on track or not. We wouldn't be in the mess that we are in if popular opinion were shaped to recognize our efforts. So it's important to develop a very strong internal compass of right and wrong. And I think it's very important to study poetry. Um, in fact, during the petitioning, every night we had a meeting and people recited poetry, whether it was sonnets by Shakespeare or Shelley or Keats. And one of our Italian American volunteers um, brought a beautiful discovery. And here I, I can't remember the name, but it was an Italian poet who it seems apparently actually invented the sonnet form. Um, but if you think about Shelley's writing, and he died very young, of course, but he was in a horribly oppressed London, um, watching a, a labor strike that was brutally put down. You know, his poem, The Mask of Anarchy, is very real. His uh, Ode to a Skylark, which is a beautiful poem, but it's about the principle of liberty. Um, so, and the poets seem to have a sense of justice, you know, like Martin Luther King saying the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Mm -hmm. He had an unshakable faith that the universe was created in such a way that justice would ultimately prevail. And I think that's really important because if you tie yourself to the external to what people are saying about you, to the nasty comments you get on your YouTube videos, or um, you know, you can you can undermine what you're doing. I think that's why people do those mean things. You know, um, people today have become so I want to say doctrinaire in their views. They have one set of views, and then there's no room for anything else. I think if I had stuck to a philosophy like that, when you and Amber had reached out to me, I could I would have I could have said, oh, a third party candidate, who needs them? But you know, I interviewed you, we've become friends, we will remain friends. And people don't seem to get that these days. Would you agree? Yes, and I think that's just part of the fear created by this media. That's why I'm saying it's really important for people. You have to do things that give you faith in the beauty of your own soul. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's been a great help to me that I'm a musician by training. Um, mm -hmm. But you see it in all the arts or or in drama. So because I don't think people want to be all cranky and crabby and fearful and nasty, but they they are fearful. Really, mm -hmm. they're fearful. And if they see it's okay to break out of the mold. Uh, you're not going to die. Someone might look at you funny, but don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, what's on the horizon for Diane Sayre? Well, as you may know, I've announced that I'm going to be challenging Gillibrand if she's running again, but I'm running for that seat in the U.S. Senate. I think we have a tremendous network in New York. 
I think my voice is urgently needed in this ugly, stinking mess of politics, and I don't want to be silent. Uh, so I am, I've announced that I'm running in 2024 for U.S. Senate in New York, and again, as an independent, unless something miraculous happens with one of the parties to convince me otherwise. Great. So, you know, Diane, we'll be talking again, you know, over the coming coming months and years. So you've been listening, you've been listening to Diane Sayre. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this sh show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Diane, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Have a happy Thanksgiving and have a great day. You too. Thank you.